Hey, I'm Matt Geiger. My goal is to give you the full story with all the information, not just the facts from the political right or left. In this video, I'm going to go through the talking points and evaluate the health insurance solutions that you hear from both sides of the political spectrum. So here's the list of common Democrat talking points around health care. The U.S. pays the most of any major country for health care. Despite this, we still have lots of uninsured people. That leads to medical bills bankrupting people. And after all this, we still have worse health outcomes. And it's all primarily caused by greedy insurance companies' profits. So to fix that, most Democrats have proposed either Medicare for all or a public option allowing people to buy into Medicare. The Republican talking points more center around opposition to Obamacare and the Democrat expansion programs, but specifically they've proposed allowing patients to purchase health insurance across state lines, expanding the use of HSAs and HRAs, that's health savings accounts and health reimbursement accounts, and loosening or eliminating the Obamacare rules around insurers. So let's dive into the specifics on each of these, starting with the Democrats' cost argument. We unequivocally pay more than any other country per person on health care by any measure, but we need to really understand why that is to unpack the argument. This is called a waterfall chart. It shows you the reason for changes between two numbers. So here I'm showing roughly what's causing the difference between our health care costs versus what they spend in other developed countries. The cost difference is primarily from higher prices, specifically higher prices for hospital services, and diagnostic tests, as well as higher pharmaceutical drugs. The other large piece here is the higher admin costs. The second argument is that we have lots of uninsured people, and that's also true. 9% of Americans don't have health insurance at all. In most other developed countries, the government either automatically covers everybody or every person's required to get health insurance. So uninsured rates in other countries are basically close to zero. Supporters of an expanded role for Medicare talk about the number of people driven into bankruptcy by medical bills. They say 62% of bankruptcies are caused by medical bills. This claim was based on a since discredited study. Further studies have found that there's no difference between bankruptcy rates for the insured and uninsured, which indicates that medical bills aren't the primary driver of bankruptcy. A separate study came up with 4% of bankruptcies caused by medical bills, and that's most likely closer, but definitely too low based on the methodologies in that study. The reality is a lot of times somebody will have a medical catastrophe, which will impact income, like a plumber breaks his leg, for instance, and then can't work. So you can't necessarily blame healthcare expenses or health insurance on that. The real percent of bankruptcies that are caused by healthcare bills is probably somewhere in the high single digits or low double digits. As far as outcomes go, politicians repeat the phrase that we have worse health outcomes than other major countries despite our healthcare spending. So let's get into what they mean by that. Typically, they're referring to two of the more commonly reported numbers, infant mortality, the number of children who die within the first year, and life expectancy, how many years somebody is actuarially expected to live. And if you just look at these two numbers, we are significantly behind the pack. But to look deeper, I've got more waterfall charts here for you. I compared the U.S. specifically to the United Kingdom, but you get a similar overall story no matter which major country you used. On infant mortality, you can see the U.K. is at 3.8 deaths per thousand live births and we're at 5.7. The biggest factor here is just reporting differences, which is good news for the U.S. We count births that other countries just don't. Unfortunately, that still leaves about 60% of the gap. Birth weight explains 0.4 of that remaining gap, meaning that we have a higher share of babies born either prematurely or to mothers who use tobacco, alcohol, or drugs. And the final major piece is sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, in babies older than one month old. It's really important to understand that almost the whole gap, except for reporting obviously, goes away if you were to control for socioeconomic differences. So it's mainly about how a mother treats her body while pregnant and how the baby's cared for. It's your call if you think that's a failing of our healthcare system or the Department of Health or local government or community or family structure or whatever, but that's the full story behind that number. Life expectancy is the other major health indicator politicians like to point to. The UK comes in at 81.2 and we come in at 78.9. The biggest differences are from obesity, drug use, motor vehicle deaths, and suicide. And I would call these more issues of prevention. Once an obese person is being treated or a drug user comes into the hospital, they aren't statistically worse off for being in the US. Similar to infant mortality, it's your call on if you want to task these sorts of issues with the healthcare system or not, but it's not like our doctors are less competent or anything like that. In fact, when it comes to actual medical treatments, the U.S. is one of, if not the best, in lots of cancer survival statistics and mortality rates out of heart attack and stroke. 
The final talking point that may be the most common one is the blame on corporate profits, mainly from insurance companies and drug companies. So insurance profits are baked into the admin piece on our cost waterfall. So you can see that is a driver, but not the obvious largest driver. Same with drug costs. But these barns aren't entirely just profits either. So what Democrats refer to is only a fraction of these drug and admin bars. The majority of the admin variance is the cost associated with hospital and physician billing related expenses and drug costs costs are largely driven by PBMs, pharmacy benefit managers. Certainly profit is a piece of the puzzle, but the focus on drug and insurance profits is misplaced. So to solve these issues, Medicare for All is one solution that's proposed by a contingent of Democrats. This takes slightly different forms depending on the version that you're looking at, but I'm going to use Bernie Sanders' version in general. So what this does is it gets rid of private insurance and instead replaces it with Medicare coverage for everybody with no co-pays, deductibles, or out-of-pocket spending. This is what's known as a single-payer system, meaning that instead of private health insurance companies, employers, and the government all paying health claims, you only have the government as the single insurer. This is considered the most progressive approach being proposed and would prohibit private insurance from covering any of the benefits that are already covered under Medicare. So would Medicare for All solve the Democrat critiques of the current system? On cost, it would cut out the problem that Democrats point out of insurer profits, but as we talked about, prices are the main factor in how much we pay. But progressives say Medicare for All has a solve for that too. With single payer, the government will be able to negotiate rates on everything with tons of negotiating power. In theory, Medicare will see that we're paying more for a certain procedure than European countries and just decide to pay less. And since they're the only game in town, all hospitals will need to fall in line. And that's likely to happen based on how it's played out in other countries and the fact that Medicare pays less less than private insurance today, but you need to take into account the fact that lobbyists and special interests are likely to have a significant seat at the table, just as they're involved in setting Medicare reimbursement rates for physicians in the same way that they successfully lobbied Congress to block automatic Medicare cuts every year under the sustainable growth rate until Congress repealed it entirely in 2015. Medicare for All's largest impact would be insuring 100% of people. By definition, that problem would get solved in its entirety. The peace of mind for uninsured people and simplification of the process is really what you're getting here. So that's an analysis of the Democrat claims and what my research turned up. How about what its detractors say? Republicans and even some Democrats have asked how this could be implemented and how we would pay for it. Republicans have brought up common issues in other countries with similar healthcare systems, especially wait times and procedure rationing. 